Okay, so should you bring Kubernetes on your edge road trip? Uh, welcome. So I'm uh, Frédéric Desbiens, or Fred. I manage IoT and edge computing programs at the Eclipse Foundation. I've been a developer, architect, program, program and product manager at many companies, and I am a published author. And coming December 2022, you'll be able to pick the perfect gift for your significant author, of course, my book. Um, stay tuned, it's not uh, available uh, yet, and uh, I hope that the publishers will send me the proofs for proofreading, because I'm starting to be a bit nervous. In early in November, I haven't seen the proof, so I don't know how much time they will have to print those, so maybe this will slip. Anyway, so, should you bring Kubernetes at the edge? Well. If you bring it, you don't want the result that you see on this slide, which is, you know, a very aggressive Kubernetes on the back, <laughs> on the back seat, you know, a bit pouting about the fact that you're bringing it to a destination it's not meant for. So I have on this slide, you know, I will have this little animation, the ultimate answer to the question, whether you should bring Kubernetes on the trip. And so the ultimate answer is maybe, so yes and no, maybe, it depends, all of those variations. Ultimately, you know, those days you have the feeling that Kubernetes is the answer to everything. Oh, I want to do cloud native, ah, Kubernetes, you know. I, uh, what are we eating for supper, Kubernetes, you know, it's everywhere. But the goal of this presentation is really to get you thinking about whether Kubernetes is a good choice if you are doing an edge computing project. And I'm not saying that I will give you all the keys to weave or to find your own answer to that, but at least my goal is to give you some, some thoughts, some starting points to get you thinking, okay? Because if the answer is spontaneously yes to this question, then you are probably looking for trouble six months, 12 months from now when you will deploy. All right, so um, we'll take the time to set the stage and uh, think about a few definitions, and then we'll look at typical workloads that you will find at the edge. I'm, I'm not pretending I'm doing an over, a comprehensive overview of all the types of workloads, but we'll look at a few typical ones, and then we'll really focus on Kubernetes at the edge. How can you run it? What are your options there? And what are your options to not run it? <laughs> okay, so alternative platforms. And finally, I will present EdgeOps, which is the vision that we put together, that we created together at the Edge Native Working Group at the Eclipse Foundation, uh, where we are working on edge computing. All right, so uh, I asked uh, before we officially started, uh, where, what was your personal definition uh, for edge computing? So this is one that I'm fairly comfortable with. So we are taking compute, storage, networking capabilities outside of the cloud, outside of the data center, and in some cases you will have the kind of elasticity that we may expect from the cloud. Okay, so roughly speaking, that's, I think, a good starting point for a definition. Now, um, of course, you don't do edge computing out of nowhere. You're trying to solve specific challenges or problems if you are thinking about edge computing. And I put a few of those on the slides. First, of course, edge computing is about reducing latency. If you are automating a nuclear power plant, and you have a very bright AI taking decisions about that, and you put it in the cloud, well, of course, if you need to decide to close this particular valve, and that you have to go all the way to the cloud and back before you get an answer, everyone is already dead. Why? Because the latency of the public internet, you have no control over that. Or even on your own local network, you may have surprises, of course. Um, former Cisco, we are trying to sell deterministic networking equipment and very expensive stuff like that, right? But even with that, you have, yeah, you should be careful. So anyway, all of that to say that you want to reduce latency, then maybe edge computing in your case is a good idea. Then there's the whole thing about bandwidth. Okay, it's great that you can do video analytics, you put AI all over the place, but if you want to do video analytics, for example, a full HD video flow, one hour of that is roughly three gigabytes, depending on the compression and things like that. 
Yeah, so uh, T-Mobile, Vodafone, or whoever, Telecom, uh, whatever, they will love you pretty much if you send a full, <laughs> you know, a full video stream for 200, 2,000 cameras all the time to the cloud when you don't even need to analyze that all the time. Okay, they will love you, but of course, maybe you should do some local processing using edge computing if you have that type of application. So large data set, and uh, of course, you need to analyze that in real time. Then there's the whole resiliency aspect. Of course, we see more and more natural disasters in the world. So if your application needs to be resilient, the fact that you deploy infrastructure, you know, in the field rather than in the cloud could be an advantage there. And of course, there's the whole aspect of data sovereignty, right? The Eclipse Foundation has its GitLab servers in the EU for specific reasons that go along geopolitics, for example, right? Increasingly, people are wary about putting stuff in the US for political reasons. So if you have scenarios like that, or if you work in healthcare, where you need to guarantee that patient records will stay in that particular hospital, or in that particular uh, lander, if we talk about Germany, or even in, in, inside the EU, or you want to prevent a doctor to accessing the records if he is vacationing in Australia, you know, he should be you know, in his office to, to check those things. So if location is, physical location is important for your data, then edge computing is your friend. And of course, there are many other reasons to use it. But from my point of view, five years from now, from now, 10 years from now, apart from very simple applications, there will be no IoT project or industrial uh, automation project that could go straight to the cloud. You will always have a dimension of edge computing in the middle. OK, well, maybe I will be proven wrong, but at least this is what I see. So. What makes edge native different from the typical cloud native application there? There are many, many things, but I put, I think, three very important things on that particular slide. First, when you work at the edge, you must, you must assume that the network will fail or degrade at any time. And this is something that you should take care in the way that you architecture your system and write your code. OK, this is really important. And of course, you know, the easiest way to take that into account is to work with an edge computing platform that will facilitate that. So you have less code to write and the platform will take care of things for you up to a point. OK, that's really important. Um, my brother hates this. He works for Cisco. But, you know, the, the fact is that you should never trust the network. Never, never, never. OK, the second aspect. Um, you need, in the case of edge computing, to think about power and si uh, optimizations for size and power very early. Why? Because you may have to work over battery power, or even if you work over, you know, uh, uh, regular DC or regular AC power, the fact is you are deploying this thing in the wild, okay? You put, let's say, um, a little edge compute node on every locomotive for the Deutsche Bahn. OK, when you do that, OK, when do you think you will, will be the next time you will change all of those nodes? Not in six months, not in two years or three years when you throw away your laptop. That's the typical life cycle in most organizations. You are deploying for five, ten years or even more. You know, if you do industrial automation, you know, Volkswagen, when they replace the equipment in a car factory, when, that, when, when does that happen? Every 25 years or something? So you need to think ahead. You need really to think over the long term. And um, in many applications, uh, it means if you don't optimize for power consumption, your equipment will be less reliable because you are deploying in bad conditions with bad cooling, bad airflow, things could happen, and you are very remote. OK, you won't be able to remove the leaves or the dust very often, which means, you know, by you know, obsessing about power consumption early, you can have infrastructure that will last for longer in the field. And that's a very important consideration. OK. And finally, there's the whole dimension of zero trust. You are deploying stuff outside the boundaries of your organization and anywhere could pick up one of those devices and try to compromise them and abuse them and then you know, uh, send bad data to your servers, for example, just to, 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 to make you mad or something like that. Which means 
there is no trust at the edge. Every device is a potential enemy, and you should design around this. And once again, this is much easier to implement when you have a platform that has that baked in compared to uh, something that you would build for, for yourself. Okay, now, uh, already I gave examples about uh, typical workloads, but let's have a look at um, you know, what, what it means to work at the edge. First, many edge computing projects are not about IT. They are about operational technology. So industrial automation is a very good example than that. And when, when we say operational technology, those guys are a different crowd. When you think about the factory, for example, stopping just for an afternoon, let's say you have to put a firmware update on robots, you stop for an afternoon, okay? And this is 15 million euro lost in production value. So they have a very conservative mindset. This is about stability and then security maybe, but above all, it's about stability and productivity of the environment. Okay? And of course, typically when you work in an environment like that, you are controlling critical infrastructure. Critical in the sense that maybe you will kill someone if it uh, misoperates, or uh, if that's not the case, uh, you will have significant financial losses uh, at the minimum. And then of course the updates in that situation are typically infrequent. You compare that to the situation in IT, where you, we use off-the-shelf, you know, uh, generic black laptops and things like that, and they are highly replaceable, you know. Um, for me, it's very easy to switch operating systems in, on this machine because most of the stuff I have is already in the cloud or something like that. I don't care particularly about that machine. And of course, I update it frequently because it's easy. And anyway, uh, you know, all, all of the major software publishers now uh, update their services and, play and, and products all the time. You know, the time where you wait for six months for a service pack or something like that is, is you know, a day, something of the past. So uh, another thing to uh, remember about the edge is really that this is a continuum. Okay, there is no one single way to architecture things. And if you talk to telcos or people from Etsy or something like that, oh, carrier, carrier uh, edge and that kind of stuff, and they will try to put that into categories. But the truth is, you may, to support your use case, to have to deal, yes, maybe with the, 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 the telcos and things like that and benefit from the services that they offer at the edge. But really, depending on the application, the various components okay, for your application and the various components that make up the management plane, the data plane, the control plane for your application. They may be all over the place depending on your requirements, functional and non-functional, okay? So this is really important. So this means this, there's really this continuum from the edge all the way up to the cloud. And um, once again, you know, your platform for edge computing should be able to support very flexible for all of those potential types of deployments. Now, every year uh, at the Eclipse Foundation, uh, we do an IoT and Edge developer survey. In fact, we have two surveys, one for developers, one for commercial adoption. And uh, I, I, um, I, I've, uh, I didn't have the time, but we just published the 2022 version of that survey. So you have the 2021 figures there, but if you go to our website, you will see the 2022 figures. Uh, but essentially, when we look at the workloads, you know, everyone is talking those days about AI at the edge. There were some good presentations uh, about that, and that's very important. But the truth is, the workloads are very, pretty, more diversified than that. Yes, people do AI, but they do control logic. So they control machines and, and programmable logic controllers and things like that at the edge as well. Data analytics are also very important, as is sensor fusion. The fact that you gather data from many, many, many sensors, and then you send um, uh, bundled uh, uh, data updates somewhere else for deep analysis. And then, at the technical level, this is not just about containers as well. This is really important. Of course, containers are important, and they are fantastic. But, you know, VMs are still a part of the mix. Uh, native binaries, script files, serverless functions, all of that can be found at the edge. So, if you obsess about Kubernetes and containers only, you are missing something from your picture. 
because depending on what you're trying to achieve, the kind of hardware you're driving, your functional and non-functional requirements, maybe a container is not the best idea for that specific application. So if you tie yourself to Kubernetes for everything, then, uh, of course, uh, you are limiting your options. And so there is also a variety of operating systems that you could run on at the edge. And typically in the cloud, on your laptop, on your smartwatch, your phone, you are running a time-sharing operating system. So we are slicing and dicing the compute capabilities. This is an old term, you know, uh, the Unix time-sharing system, it was called back in the 60s. Um, I wasn't around to see that, but still that dates me that I talk about time-sharing operating systems. Anyway, um, all of this to say that the goal of the operating system that you have on your personal device is to pro reduce latency, perceived latency for the end user and maximize resource utilization. I want to get as many containers as possible on that server. So that's great. Run Linux, run Windows, run, you know, a time-sharing operating system. Good. But the problem is, you know, real-time requirements require real-time operating systems. And a real-time OS is a very different beast, because the goal there is to have absolutely guaranteed latency when you have an operation, okay? This means every 15 milliseconds, you know, I have a guarantee there will be a tick in my system and that something will happen. Of course, if I write bad, bad code, <laughs> maybe I will miss a tick or two, right? So there's no, yeah, you need to be careful. But at least the OS is able to give you that guarantee. And you will tell me, but there, real, there, there is real-time Linux. Well, if you, I'm no specialist of that domain, okay? But go to a conference. Talk to embedded people about embedded Linux and specifically about real-time Linux. And they will tell you you're, you're not serious about the domain. Okay, why? Because there are many things in Linux that are not compatible with the real-time patches for the kernel. And they are merging those to upstream right now and it's a long process. Okay, great. And for some usages, it's good. I'm not saying it's crap. Okay, it's good. But this is not hard real-time. Okay. So be, 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 be careful about that. And of course, you know, if you have trouble running Linux for your real-time use case, yes, you will put Kubernetes on the top of that and it will be good. Yes, right. Okay. So you got me there. So Kubernetes at the edge. What does that mean? What are the options there? So I'm not covering this in detail in the sense I'm giving you the contours of the main options <laughs> just to contrast them, but there are more options than what I will cover. The, this is a very, of course, dynamic market. So first you have the option of going to the CNCF website and download plain vanilla Kubernetes on the left uh, of the slide. Uh, that's the left, yes. <laughs> so uh, you see many, many components in there and, and, and lots of, of course, complexity. Uh, you see etcd. <laughs> I'm already, if you're working with Kubernetes, I'm already wary of, Kuber uh, of etcd in the data center or in the cloud. So can you imagine at the edge? Anyway, that's a uh, whole other debate. But anyway, so lots of complexity, but of course it works. You can deploy plain Kubernetes or any distribution from, from Red Hat in OpenShift to the IBM version or whatever, you know, there are plenty of vendors in that space. You can deploy that at the edge if you can um, f uh, keep your container slim and, and, uh, and, and deploy, let's say, fairly powerful servers there. Well, not necessarily the ideal use case, right? If you are to run for five years on battery, but anyway. Um, then in the middle, you see the approach uh, chosen by the K3S project from Rancher and, and some other lightweight Kubernetes distribution, where essentially the approach is to take all of the upstream code and build a single binary out of it and cutting some features to make it slimmer. So K3S can run, uh, if I remember well, um, in, in, in roughly 500 meg megabytes of memory or something like that, or maybe a bit smaller. Uh, Personally, I don't, uh, I don't remember. And of course, you see etcd is not uh, in the picture for K3S. They are using embedded databases, typically SQLite there. Um, so, of course, this is true 
Kubernetes, in the sense, it's the same code. It supports the same API, and there's a specific agent that you use to manage your containers uh, on your node, and you can even have K3S clusters. And then there's the QBadge approach. So QBadge is another uh, open source project. And in their case, instead of uh, using or reusing the full uh, source code for the full Kubernetes platform, they have this API server. They integrate with Kubernetes, but they have this cloud core and this edge hub okay, that they wrote themselves that integrate with the standard Kubernetes API. So when you use KubeEdge, essentially you will use uh, kubectl to do your deployments and things like that and control the infrastructure the same way. Okay? But then the Cloud Core and Edge Hub components will deploy things at the edge and take care of the rest. Okay? So this is a kind of Kubernetes compatible approach okay, where you have edge optimized components that integrate with uh, the control plane. But, you know, the whole the, 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 the old ecosystem is much wider than that. And, and here I put a number of options on the slide. I'm not discussing those in details, just to attract your attention that we've got three Eclipse projects in there. Maybe you weren't aware of them. Eclipse uh, FogOS, so it's pronounced 05. Uh, no, it's written 05, it's pronounced for OS. This is what happens when you let engineers name a project, I guess. Uh, anyway, so uh, for OS supports binaries virtual, uh, for microcontrollers, containers, and VMs, for example. Eclipse IO Fog is container centric, but um, it can integrate with Kubernetes, but it's much more lightweight and has uh, really edge focused features in there. And we have the, the brand new Eclipse Canto platform which is getting some traction in the SDV uh, community, so, so software defined vehicle. So um, it focuses on containers as well, but it's got some IoT oriented features to manage uh, log uploads to the cloud or things like that, for example. So it's a bit more functionally specialized, but certainly a worthwhile option. And, and of course, one that I should have had, I see my Eurotech friend at the back of the room. So I need to update this slide to reflect the fact that Eclipse Cura, um, the gateway platform, uh, open source from Eurotech in the Eclipse IoT Working Group as now container management uh, features as well. And um, uh, I should say, well, this is a very dynamic, uh, of course, market. So sometimes uh, I don't have uh, the time to completely refresh before I present. But uh, yeah, so don't forget Eclipse Cura. So four Eclipse options for you to try uh, in order to run containers or even VMs at the edge. And of course, there's a wider ecosystem outside the Eclipse Foundation as well, uh, with things like Fledge or Open Horizon, etc. Now, let's take a look at a few use cases and ask ourselves, would I put Kubernetes there? So the modern car is a good example. It's literally a data center with plenty of computers and compute capability. And, and some people in the, in the car industry are really pushing to say, we will consolidate all of those workloads. We'll put Kubernetes in the car and it will be streamlined and easy and powerful and all of that. Um, what is the wisdom of that? Well, it depends on the use case. When you look at all the exciting features in new car, you know, I have e-commerce features, I have uh, driver safety features, predictive maintenance, driver assistance, keep me in my lane uh, if I'm falling asleep or things like that. Or in the case of a Tesla car, accelerating to crush a pedestrian uh, or not. Anyway, um, out of that to say that some of those functions could be in containers and it's no big deal if, you know, infrastructure kills the container and restarts a new one. Okay, infotainment, I can tolerate a few, a few seconds without music. But then, of course, driver assistance, safety. Uh, I don't want my ABS brakes to reboot when I'm, you know, in a 15% in a uh, descent as I am getting out of the Alps, for example, or something like that. That's not the right time. So some of those things can be in containers and some of those don't. Right? Because there are real time and uh, mission critical requirements hidden in there. Okay? So blindly putting everything into containers um, wouldn't be very, uh, a, very, uh, a very prudent approach. Then thinking about industrial automation, the modern factory is a data center as well, right? Plenty of networks, servers all over the place, or at least edge nodes. Um, 
But then, uh, the, this is a diagram taken from the documentation for the Eclipse Basics project. And what I want to impart them is that there are several layers of control in the modern factory. So at the bottom, you've got the field level, literally the sensors or even machines operating. So there's the device level, there is middleware in the middle, and then at the plant level, you will have what they call in industrial automation the SCADA system, so the thing that is literally driving all of the industrial processes in there. So maybe that SCADA system can be in containers to scale it and all of that. But do I want little containers in all of those very precise industrial robots? You know, they are, they are literally making... Um, making uh, Come on, I just have the French word uh, coming to my mind. Well, weld, you know, it's welding your very expensive Bugatti car, and even, you know, 10 milliseconds of delay will completely ruin the whole metal sheet and you have to restart again. Well, you don't want that to happen because there will be a uh, you know, sudden latency in the system and things like that. Kubernetes is the ultimate way to run and scale stateless workloads, but in many industrial processes, you have plenty of state to take into account. So you need to be aware of that and pick the right tool for the right use case, of course. And then there's AI. AI is very popular at the edge. Um, you have to remind yourself that when you have a decision process implemented in an uh, AI uh, system, uh, of course, each node is only operating, in this case, on a fragment of the whole data set, which may involve biases of various things. Uh, your little edge node is under uh, a pipe that's dripping a bit, then, of course, your humidity readings may be a bit off. And, of course, you may correct that when you aggregate everything into the global model, but if you're making local decisions about your local data, maybe you will make the right one. So you need to be a bit more prudent about that. And then error functions, which is something that you need when you have uh, un unmanaged or uh, surprising conditions, let's say. Uh, well, uh, in some cases, you will leave those in the cloud because they are more expensive to run. Okay, you don't have the local horsepower to run. But of course, the network is not reliable, so you have to design around the fact that maybe you won't be able to call for help. Okay? And of course, uh, optimization is in heavily influenced uh, for edge nodes uh, by local conditions. So you have to take all of that into account if you're doing AI at the edge. So in the end, those questions that you see on the slide are really the ones that you should ask yourself when picking your edge compute platform. Okay? How predictable will be your latency? Okay? Don't forget that real-time systems you know, mission-critical systems have real-time requirements. Can you afford to lose data? You know, that sounds silly. No, I want all of my data. No, you don't. No, you don't. If you are doing a smart building, okay, you are measuring temperature, humidity, and things like that, air quality in every room of this uh, convention center. How many times per minute or per second do you need those values? Okay, you can skip a few. I'm quite sure that e even if you report, uh, report every 10 seconds, nobody will die in there, right? Okay, so pay attention to that because not every application needs a constant stream uh, of data that will generate petabytes of uh, uh, historical data in, in some database. In some cases, you need to do that, but in some other cases, it's okay if you skip a few readings. And then, are the various container instances you would be running or the, the program instances you would be running, are they unique or not? Do you have local state that you can't afford to lose? Or can you just restart things when, go, when things go wrong because it's just a container, it seems to be unresponsive, let's kill it. That's the, the Kubernetes mentality. You know, no container has value in Kubernetes infrastructure because you can always spawn more to replace those who are failing. And then, um, how constrained are your nodes? And you will tell me, oh, it's very easy to get very powerful hardware at the edge. Yes. But once again, you may operate on battery power, you may want to reduce power consumption because you want this device to really last 10 years, you know, without any maintenance or possibility to maintain it. 
Okay? And uh, don't forget that there is little to no elasticity at the edge because yes, up to a point you may have elasticity and you need to over provision a bit to account for potential growth in what you need to do. But there are limits to that. Your boss will not like you if you're putting, uh, I don't know, Ryzen 9's everything in every edge node where maybe a little ARM chip that costs 30 bucks could do the job, right? So you need to be careful about that. And finally, how far will you be from the ultimate control plane where you are at the edge? Don't forget this is a continuum, but the edge, depending on your use case, can be very far. Okay, I'm you know, controlling drones in the tundra in Norway versus, you know, I am uh, doing a smart convention center and I have edge nodes on every floor, for example. So the, the physical, the distance from the, between the actual physical edge and whatever, whatever place the control plane will be, you know, can be very large, can be very small. And one last thing, okay, don't, whatever you're trying to do, don't try to make stateful Kubernetes happen. It won't. Many people tried. I was at Pivotal. We were trying to make that happen. Very bad idea. Very bad idea. Kubernetes is the ultimate way, once again, to run stateless workloads. Okay? So be mindful of that. So when is Kubernetes a bad fit? When do you want to leave Kubernetes at home? You don't want to bring it, you know, on your edge road trip. First, anything that's real time, anything that's mission critical, that's not a good fit. Containers, you know, introduce a layer of indirection compared to hardware. And if you are doing real time stuff, you cannot be too far from the hardware. Otherwise, you know, you will get yourself into trouble. Of course, constraint devices, because even in K3S, okay, you can squeeze it to a size, but no way it will fit on a microcontroller with two megabytes of memory or something like that, right? And of course, if you are doing heterogeneous hardware, I have x86 node, I have ARM node, I have uh, RISC-V nodes, and I want to do a Kubernetes cluster of all of those. Theoretically, with ARM and x86, it starts to be possible right now with Kubernetes, but don't, this is not mature at all, you know. Don't, <laughs> don't bet your job on that working at this point in time in history. Maybe five years from now, this will be mature and we can mix and match. For the time being, this is pretty much experimental and risky, and I absolutely recommend against it. However, there are specialized edge computing platforms that are much better at handling heterogeneous sets of nodes. Okay? So, ultimately, okay, the edge is not about just Kubernetes. Okay, so this is an image extracted from a white paper we wrote in the Edge Native Working Group. And when I say we, <laughs> I was the facilitator, of course, the merit goes to our community members. But essentially, we tried to position Eclipse project, the ones in color, versus other important projects at the edge, okay, in gray. And you see, you see Kubernetes there, you see OpenStack there, you see uh, OpenAB or EdgeX Foundry and things like that. And ultimately, they are all good things. We just tried to position them on the ed cloud to edge, uh, edge to cloud continuum, on the development to operations continuum, to give an idea of what kind of coverage we had. And you look at all of those color logos and you look at uh, what we have available at the Eclipse Foundation, not bad, we've got uh, good coverage, and uh, that's, that's really great. And, and I would move probably the Cura option for our Eurotech friends now that it supports containers in some way. But anyway, out of that to say, you know, the, the, the message important here, the important message is not the actual location of any of those project logos. The fact is that you need much more than Kubernetes to really deploy edge infrastructure at scale. Okay, and this happens partly at the Eclipse Foundation and of course outside of it in other communities, but we are working in the Edge Native Working Group very closely with those guys to ensure that what we have to offer makes sense and that we integrate with, you know, market standards up and including Kubernetes because, once again, there's a place for it, but maybe not at the very physical, at the very end of the, of the continuum in the physical world. And this brings us to our Edge Ops vision at the Edge Native Working Group. So there's a full-blown white paper on that, and I will go very quickly about the, the, the concept of Edge, uh, Edge Ops here. But essentially, um, Edge Ops is about making DevOps 
a good edge citizen. Because think about it, DevOps, okay, fantastic way to build software. It completely transformed the way we are doing software in the real world, right? Um, you, you bring together operations and developers, that's a good thing. You do continuous integration, continuous deployment, uh, that's a good thing. Not, well, that's a good thing maybe for the cloud, but at the edge, everyone is on the autobahn, you know, driving 200 an hour or more you know, 4 p 4.30 p.m. in the afternoon. Oh yes, now it's the time to patch my, my, my smart autobahn infrastructure and patch all of those cars as they are driving 200 an hour. No, you, you can do continuous integration at the edge, no problem. And even there, maybe you need to be careful. Remember my OT people that are very conservative? Maybe even continuous integration is too much for them. Or at least you, knew you need to do lots and lots of additional testing to keep them happy. Okay, but continuous deployment? No way, no way. In some cases, your drones in the Norway tundra will just get in range for a software update two days from now or something like that. Okay, so you cannot count on updates to be continuously deployed. So that means that doing a plain a DevOps approach at the edge is not a very good idea. So essentially, EdgeOps is to say we take the good base, the good foundations of DevOps principles, and then taking into account the challenges that the edge, uh, that edge computing can help you solve, the characteristics of edge computing solutions, the fact, for example, that they are much more longer lived than the typical IT infrastructure. The, the types of deployments that you do at the edge, remember, not just containers, but uh, serverless functions and scripts and, and VM images and straight binaries to microcontrollers. So taking account, into account all of that, you need uh, an edge computing platform that has built, built from the ground up for the edge, and edge jobs is the way that we define this particular vision. And this happens in the Edge Native Working Group at uh, the Eclipse Foundation. So we are code first. We don't care so much about abstract architectures and glossy white papers. This is about coding real platforms that real people are using. Okay, and I'm not saying POC pl platforms, you know, real customers. And, and of course, EdgeOps is the vision that ties everything together. So right now, that's four projects. Eclipse IOFOG from EdgeWorks, Eclipse FogOS from Zetascale, Eclipse Canto, and Eclipse Zeno, plus Cura, of course, Eclipse Cura from Eurotech uh, in the mix with it. So, so I need to update that once again. Damn, oh gosh. Anyway, all of this to say that we have plenty of platforms for you to try depending on your needs. And all of it is Eclipse, all of it is open source. So we are all one big happy Eclipse family. So please come see us. And uh, well, that's the current membership. You will see LF Edge as a member. So we care about uh, other industry players as well. We swapped memberships with there. So it, this is not just about trying to overtake the Edge ecosystem on your own. Okay, this is about building something that makes sense for us. But of course, collaborating with others in the wider open source ecosystem. So please follow us, the Edge Native Working Group on social media, try our platforms and, and join us if you are interested in driving this. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your presence. And now if we have uh, some time left or if you have patience left, we can go to questions. So any questions? No, you want the beer. I understand that. <laughs> Or maybe it was that I was exceptionally clear for once. <laughs> or maybe, rather than questions, does this make sense to you? Are, you? are you convinced now that the answer is maybe? Yeah? Okay, good. If, if you are living with just that, then uh, I'm happy. <laughs> Excellent. So thank you so much once again, and don't hesitate to get in touch if you want to go deeper on some of the topics. Of course, my job is literally to let you know about those great open source projects we have in the space. So uh, don't hesitate. Thank you. <laughs>